We don't think much about trash until it starts piling up. Imagine a way for trash cans to tell us when they need to be emptied. Compounds that make chili peppers hot might also affect our metabolism. Could this spicy stuff be put to work to help people lose weight? And this green liquid isn't a health food, but getting to the clues inside of it could help science answer important questions about how plants thrive. Next on Catalyst. This YouTube edition of Catalyst is brought to you by Arizona PBS and Arizona State University. Life has problems. Science turns them into questions that can lead to solutions and even innovations. This is Catalyst, shaping the future through science research at Arizona State University. Have you ever tasted a green machine smoothie? It's a health drink full of green vegetables like kale and spinach. Now that green color comes from a natural substance called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is not particularly tasty, but it is essential to plant life. Biologists think uncovering the structure of plant cells is key to making greener alternatives to fossil fuels. To see these tiny green machines in action, each sample undergoes a deep freeze before its photo is taken. This combination of green plants, fast cameras, and freezing temperatures is now a revolutionary recipe for new discoveries. Despite what it may look like, Ela Taporic is not making a smoothie. She's crushing plant cells in order to see deep inside them. Photosynthesis is one of the most important processes in nature. It's essentially responsible for all the food we eat and the fuel we use. Photosynthetic organisms are expert on harvesting the abundant solar energy and converting it into chemical energy. They can be our solution for sustainable energy source. Toporic's research requires several steps, but the ultimate goal is to discover the design of photosystems, tiny machines in plant cells that convert light to energy. We study how photosynthetic organisms harvest the light energy by exploring the structure of photosynthetic complexes using cryo-electron microscopy. Cryo-electron microscopy is also known as cryo-EM. It's the name of a research technique that requires freezing a sample before filming it with a powerful microscope. Last year, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry was given to three pioneers of cryo-electron microscopy. Jacques de Boucher, Joachim Frank, and Richard Henderson. Today, it's a popular method for researching delicate molecules. We switched totally to cryo-EM technique because it demands less protein sample and you can also explore the dynamic uh, state of the protein. ASU's cryo-EM machine is located at the I-Ring Material Center. Dwight Williams is a research associate who helps scientists operate the microscope. We are currently in front of the Titan Krios, which is our latest generation microscope for looking at biological samples at liquid nitrogen temperatures. So this is a cryogenic TEM, is what we call that, for a cryogenic transmission electron microscope. My role here is to basically teach ASU researchers how to perform cryo-TEM. So we primarily look at biological samples, mostly purified proteins. We purify them, and then we look at them frozen in amorphous ice so that we can image the individual molecules floating in a liquid. So this is where it gets really fun. I gotta fill it up with liquid ethane. And the reason we use liquid ethane called liquid nitrogen temperature, because liquid ethane is a liquid at liquid nitrogen temperatures and it has a fairly good capacity to absorb heat. And so when we plunge our very thin TEM grid, it won't bubble and insulate around where the grid is plunged into it. For Taparik's project, he squeezes a drop of her plant proteins onto a tiny circular grid. So we're going to bring the grid down into the application position, and we're going to apply a small volume of our photo system to the surface. And we're going to mix it around and try to go on the back side of it as well. Is it a blot and drop? This is the exciting part. Grid is plunged into it. Here we go. 
Williams loads the frozen proteins into a specialized canister that slides into the side of the cryo-EM machine. We can load up to 12 samples at a time into a, a little machine we call the autoloader, and that's on the side of the microscope. So we can run this microscope for seven days at minus 192 degrees centigrade, and the samples can stay in the microscope that entire time. And an arm can come in and pick up a grid off that cassette, which is very similar to a PEZ dispenser, and it'll pick up one grid at a time and lift the cassette out of the way and then deliver it over here to the stage. And the stage is, then allows us to move around and visualize the different positions on that TEM foil. The microscope starts from the top where there's an electron source. So this is a field emission gun, so it's a shot key emitter, 300,000 electron volts. And then it forms a beam by these electromagnetic lenses. And so the electrons come down, pass through our sample at this level, and then come all the way down to the bottom of the microscope where they're imaged on these cameras down here. As you may know, electrons in biology don't go good together. If you've been struck by lightning, you know that's very painful and sometimes it burns you. Well, the electrons in the electron microscope are 300,000 electron volts, and so we have to really limit the dose that goes through the biological samples because as the electrons go through the material, they destroy it very quickly. So we take very low dose images, so we try to put 20 electrons per angstrom squared, so an angstrom is a tenth of a picometer, and so these are very, very small dimensions. To give you some perspective, imagine you are standing on the moon. You look up to see the Earth. With the Titan Creos microscope, you would have enough magnification power to zoom in on Sun Devil Stadium and see a football being thrown into the end zone. Once we do that, though, it's kind of like taking a picture in the dark. They're very low signal to noise, and we have to average hundreds of thousands of molecules together in order to get the signal or the information from the molecules that we need to get this structure of the protein. And if you look at this individual frame, you really have a very difficult time seeing that there's protein there. But if we turn the movie on, and so the movie's going, and now you can kind of see the protein molecules in there. So you see them? We've now aligned each of those individual frames to one another, and then we can project it out as a single sum image. And in this case, you can definitely see the individual protein molecules. Now we'll go in and we'll winnow out each of these molecules, and we'll basically cut and paste these into a stack. And the stack of images will have to be correlated to one another so that we know that this molecule is sideways, this molecule is flat, and then we can determine the angular relationship between each of the molecules. After we perform that step, we can then put all the molecules of similar views together and create what we call an average image. From a very noisy image, we can now get very high contrast images. And in this way, we can begin to sort out any molecules that have structural differences or may be damaged during the processing. So we can visualize these molecules with a software package. This is Photosystem 1. We can see that it's a trimer. And we can see that there's little pillars that stick out from the top. And so at lower isosurfaces, what we call this, or where we include more noise in the density, you can see it looks very similar to what we see in the EM images. And if we go and look at only the stronger signals, we can see that these correspond to tubular shapes. And these tubular shapes are the amino acid sequences that form helices and beta sheets in the molecule. So you can see very clearly how this molecule encompasses the individual strands. And so there's another way we can look at this by slicing through it a little bit. I can take it down to just a very thin slice. So this is a helix of amino acids, a beta sheet. We're not quite at the resolution where we can resolve individual carbon chains, but we can visualize the individual folding patterns of the molecule. By understanding the structures of these molecules, biologists like Toporic can design new ones that may help to create a more sustainable planet. 
The chili pepper may have originated in Mexico, but its popularity has evolved into hundreds of varieties and colors around the world in ever-expanding degrees of heat. They all maintain, though, one thing in common. Capsaicin, the ingredient chefs rely on for that spiciness and scientists rely on for medical breakthroughs. Researchers are now zeroing in on whether the chili pepper can help people lose weight. Walking, running, lifting weights, or just standing up, researchers will tell you getting your body moving will help raise your metabolic rate. Metabolic rate is intrinsically how your cell and your body is, uh, is working and uh, on your energy expenditure. In other words, when you're moving, you're burning calories. If I keep the same diet and activity, I will um, accumulate the energy in my body and uh, gain weight in the future. We'll sometimes hear other ideas about ways to raise your body's metabolism, like drinking cold water, getting a good night's rest, even eating spicy chili peppers. Award-winning chef Silvana Salcido Esparza has heard stories about the power of Mexican chili peppers. My grandmother being a taromara, she would cut and she would put little oh, pedacitos of chili, little pieces of chili, or even the seeds into some of her concoctions to either make it, she would say for flavor, but I, I think at the end of the day it was for spice, even in tea. When we're sick, she would take uh, semilla de chile, the seeds, and oregano, and make a tea that was horrible, but it really took everything out of your chest. Scientist Yu Dang works at Arizona State University's Biodesign Institute. She says that heat is thanks to the capsaicinoid compound in the chili pepper. She and her colleagues decided to test the chile theory whether there's a correlation on the people's metabolic rate and the um, chili pepper extraction, that's also the capsaicinoid. There has been studies showing indirectly that the um, capsaicin is uh, increasing the metabolic rate. But in this study, we just want to directly uh, see the, uh, the relationship uh, between these two and uh, how the capsaicinoid is really impacting on people's metabolic rate. 40 people participated in the study. I like spicy food, yeah. It's exciting food. I mean, compared to other flavor, I'd prefer something spicy. Half of the study group took about a jalapeno's worth of capsaicinoid in a tablet. The other half took a placebo. Now, to avoid creating bias, the tablets were made flavorless and the food bland. The bagel and some, some cream cheese. Deng used a newly developed device called a breezing machine. With it, she measured participants' metabolic rate within five to 10 minutes after taking the pill. The mobile app plugs into medical tubing, and this allowed the study to take real-time measurements of people taking part in the study. Measuring their resting energy expenditure, or oxygen to carbon ratio over several hours, Deng's team compared the people taking the pill to those who took the placebo. So what we found is that um, when people uh, take the pills, it uh, they turns to have a um, higher uh, metabolic rate increase um, over four hours. On average, those who took the capsaicinoid pill wound up burning up to 133 calories within four hours of taking it. And for the control group that they just take the placebo pill, they uh, tend to remain about the same level um, on their uh, metabolic rate. It's enough to make you want to stuff your face with the hottest chiles, but Silvana says not so fast. <laughs> As a chef, I'm always very careful to balance my food. All Mexican food is not hot. My food is balanced. And that's very true, just like every pepper here is not hot. That would be generalizing and generalizing Mexican food as well. If you're serious about adding the beneficial chile to your daily diet, there are few people as knowledgeable to ask about the chile and its preparation than the celebrated Chef Silvana. Okay, Chef Silvana, I'm looking at all of the dishes that you've laid out here for us, so many different kinds of different varieties and colors, and I can taste some of them right here in my throat. I can smell them. What are we looking at right now? You're looking at the bountiful treasures of Mexico and Las Americas. Uh, let's start out with el poblano. 
This is Mexico's number one most popular chili. That is beautiful. It's soft, it's pliable, smell that. Mm. Isn't that gorgeous? Yeah. It doesn't even smell like a pepper. No, it's sweet actually. Yeah. The poblano has hints of sweetness. Here, for example, is a chile de árbol, which is a, a one of the popular chilies that we use for everything. It's very hot. Here it is just dried, but here it is toasted. See, so you'll see that smoky, beautiful flavor. Mexicans are in love with tamarind, right? And we put chili on everything, even our desserts. I think it's part of our DNA. I was gonna say, they, you know, I think from the moment they're babies, you see that in Mexico, they're just, they love the chili. Now that Dang and her colleagues have shown chili peppers can increase the metabolic rate, they're looking at substances that might reduce our metabolic rate. We are trying to explore whether there's correlation between the pollutants, hydrocarbons exposure and the people's metabolic rate. While chili peppers may help people with their metabolism, Deng suspects the opposite is true for some organic compounds that are all around us in everyday life. The most common things that uh, we regular people are uh, facing are uh, uh, formaldehyde and the, some of the hydrocarbons at, uh, in indoor that emits from the carpets and some newly furnished uh, furniture. Most of which comes from crude oil used to make filtered oil, diesel gas, some tires, asphalt, even hand lotions. If her theory checks out, it would also make a good argument to pick up the pace and put more faith in chiles. That trash can in your kitchen, you know when it's full, and you're probably the one who empties it as well. But imagine that your job is actually keeping track of dozens, maybe hundreds of trash cans spread out over miles. That adds up to too much time spent not just emptying those cans, but simply checking for when they're full. And it is a problem a team of engineering students think they can solve. I go to ASU and uh, during my time in Memorial Union, just going to Starbucks, I saw that most of the trash cans are full and that too during like peak hours just in the morning when you're having a Starbucks drink and during the lunch time. And there was no feedback that the janitorial worker was getting that this trash can is full. So we thought how would we actually connect the worker to this trash can? How do we make that network more intelligent? And that's how we started working on our first prototype. Their first prototype evolved into a sensor that can be put inside any trash bin or dumpster. It laser scans the area of the trash container. It also senses how full or empty it is, creating data. Information about each container then can be shared and tracked. And it sends a signal to our backend, which we provide that as a service to the facility manager, which he can see as which can is full and then accordingly sent his worker to that trash can for pickup. Trash cans for 50,000 students spread across a square mile of space. That's the challenge here on the Tempe campus of Arizona State University. It has to happen quickly, predictably, and reliably, especially on hot days. Otherwise, you've got odors and even a risk to people's health. Keeping after it all falls on the shoulders of Rigoberto Polanco, the campus ground services supervisor. We have a deadline to meet our task in the morning, especially when it comes to trash. We normally start our schedule at five in the morning, so we have a time frame from five to eight before the crowds are coming on campus. What they do is they'll come up to a trash bin and they actually physically look to see the amount of trash that it has. If it's filled up all the way to the top of the bin, they will take out the actual bin itself. Since this is a busy area and there's a lot of activity going on, we will normally take out the trash bags. One of the other crew members used their mule, take the bags and go to the other trash bins. While the other co-worker of theirs, they replace it, fill it in with a new set of trash bags. The workers came to us and they were like, oh, this really helps us. Uh, now we know when the trash can is full. Because for example, Sometimes we have like a pizza party, right? There's no way the janitorial worker is going to know that your trash can is going to get full. So the janitorial worker really appreciated this technology and he's like, this makes our work much easier. Hygiea's devices can even predict when certain waste containers might be full, just based on the historical trends of that container. 
and this is a big deal. It will help us to follow that actual pattern. So for instance, if one side is foot traffic and it's very full of the trash bins, then we could actually make that into a pattern. So it will minimize the workload and it will concentrate on those trash bins that are heavy loads. And it's as simple as your Google Maps. You will have just the map of this facility and you can see which can is full. Also, we provide ways to do that. If your janitorial worker doesn't have a smartphone, uh, he uses a flip phone, you could just send him a text message, like collect these trash cans. And imagine if your worker doesn't even have a phone, uh, you could just print that out and give, hand it over to him like, like a worksheet. And that's when we got talking and we were just asking what other problems are you facing in a facility. And that's when they were like, uh, th there are the restrooms that we service, but we don't know when the, the napkins or the soaps are getting empty. How do we actually bridge that gap? How do we know that this is getting empty? And that's when we thought we could use the technology that we are using in sensors to come up with just a simple uh, device without the sensor. And that's how we developed this button. And this button has got real good feedback. They really like this because it's, it's very easy uh, to use this button. As a user, you just have to press it and the facility manager knows, okay, this restroom needs service. Right now, the solution, you might have seen, there's just a small paper that says, if the restroom needs service, please text this number. And that's so inconvenient. If I'm in an airport or something, I, I don't want to take out my phone and let the facility manager know because I don't really care is what it is, right? And if a button, it's, it's just simple from a user's perspective, you just press it and you just leave and the facility manager knows, okay, this thing needs this and he just sends a worker to service that restroom. The technology that we have come up with is replicable and scalable in so many other fields, in hotels, hospitals, the janitorial workspace itself. So we see a big application for this technology. The Risen Incubator is a program at ASU under the Walton Sustainable Solutions Initiative and Entrepreneurship and Innovation, and it's in collaboration with the City of Phoenix. We work with early stage companies in the space of circular economy to help them start and scale. Hygia is one of 10 companies in the incubator. They've got the team to do it, they've got the capacity, they have the technology piece, they've even got some capital going. So they've got the key components of which the venture needs to, to start and scale. And so the idea is how do we help them get to the next, the next level. So the sensors have a lot of opportunities to drive efficiency and reduce the amount of costs. For example, say you were to implement the sensors through a municipality at the Parks and Recs. We've got garbage cans across the city in the Parks and Recs, and right now, perhaps cities are picking them up every Thursday, right? So if you're looking at City of Phoenix specifically, that's a huge amount of coverage. The sensors would allow cities to know when they, they actually need picked up and allow them to drive some efficiencies and reduce overall costs. We are ASU students and we have come up with a good solution which we think can really help. And this also helps ASU with having a sustainable campus. I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz and what you've been watching is Catalyst, our show about shaping the future, how research creates real life results. And because our lives always have new problems that science can help to solve, We'll be back soon with more stories. Catalyst is supported by Knowledge Enterprise Development at Arizona State University. Advancing entrepreneurship, innovation, discovery, and knowledge for the public good. Subscribe to this channel to see more episodes of Catalyst on YouTube.